Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes. Hope so. Great. My name is Kate Armel, and I would like to welcome all of you to today's webinar, Navigating the Software Project Journey, How to Plot and Control the Course to Successful Outcomes. Before we get started, I'd like to make you aware of a few technical items. Everyone watching this presentation is currently on mute. To ask a question at any point in the presentation, just use the Q&A dialog at the right side of your screen. Laura will field as many of these questions as she has time for at the end of the presentation. If she doesn't have time to get to your question, don't worry. We'll save all the questions we don't get to and refer them to Laura so she can get you some answers. And I'd just like to tell you a little bit about our presenter today, Laura Zuber. Laura has 27 years of experience in software development, consulting, training, and support. She has conducted training and coaching sessions for all QSM Slim Suite tools and helped customers implement Slim across a wide variety of processes and platforms. Laura has managed software development projects served as a senior software process improvement specialist, performed process assessments, designed and implemented best practices, and authored numerous training programs. She is a certified Scrum Master and Safe Agilist. Thank you, Kate. I appreciate that and I appreciate all of you joining today as well, taking time out of your busy schedules. You know, to successfully navigate software projects in today's complex and dynamic environment, you need an, actual, an accurate picture of where you are, where you're going, and when you'll get there. You trust your GPS app to navigate across town or across the country, and likewise, you need a reliable picture of your project landscape so that you can see if your software release is on course. Your GPS, you know, will compute your average speed. Uh, it varies, right? Maybe there's an accident and your speed goes down and it will show you how far you've gone. And if you've, uh, you know, you've gone It'll show you how far you've gone, and then also, of course, that you have this far to go. And your arrival time will also get adjusted if you stop. So your highly visible software project has started, and as time goes on, how do you circle back to your original plan or estimate to make sure that the actual work to be done is taking you where you want to go? Your software project journey is dictated by your plan. And reliable plans are constructed from reliable estimates. Too many firms aren't doing empirically based estimates. They start with a goal-based estimate, you know, wanting to win the work or with a sales goal rather than a data-driven estimate. And so we wanna ask, you know, Who's really driving the bus? Both approaches, of course, involve uncertainty, and that's just the nature of estimating in the software development world. We have to deal uh, with uncertainty. However, um, you know, data-driven estimates are focused primarily on the size or the scope of the application, making sure we're focusing on um, understanding what's it going to take to deliver uh, the final product and also based on our performance. And that is basically our, our efficiency of our development organization. But even if you have the best estimate in the world and the best plan, every plan encounters reality, right? Something is gonna happen.
For over 45 years, QSM's slim suite of applications has helped thousands of organizations manage software projects throughout the life cycle. The slim estimating and forecasting methodology, and that's what I'm going to focus on today, is the two products, slim estimate and slim control, mostly on slim control, of course. But our methodology is top-down, scope-based, and it models the nonlinear behavior of software projects. We said, I just said a while ago, that reliable plans are constructed from reliable uh, estimates. And the problem that Slim Estimate solves is getting companies used to not using goal-based estimates and creating data-driven estimates. The problem Slim Control solves is tracking the actual data so you can see literally how it lines up to the plan and tells you where you'll end up. The Project Management Institute has well-defined and recommended practices for managing software projects, and QSM has mapped our Slim tool feature, Tools features to show how we support them. Today, I want to focus on a few simple steps, some of which you're mostly doing, that go beyond task, resource, and cost tracking to provide real insight into what's going on so you can make informed decisions about the best way to move forward. I'll briefly list the steps here and then share details about each. The first thing we wanna do, of course, is enter the plan and then compare it to trends. And what we mean here are some historical data. Um, you can use the QSM industry database, which I'll talk about in a little bit, or uh, a best practice, of course, would be to gather your own history and compare your estimates to, to history or your plan and to compare your plan to your own history. Then we want to enter actual data, just a few metrics, some core metrics, and you can add any other metrics that you want to um, every reporting period, whatever, you know, whatever that is for you. And then we're going to pay attention to that tracking of the actuals versus the plan. Um, you know, again, over time at regular intervals with some charts that provide that visual map of where you are. And then at appropriate points along the course, then we want to calculate some forecasts based on where we are today, where are we going to end up? And in the, you can run multiple forecasts and compare them and really get that idea of, of try out ahead of time, if you will, you know, what is the best course to take? And we call those some what if scenarios. And the final simple step really is to um, select the, the route or the forecast that achieves your most important goals. You may not be able to get everything done that you originally wanted to, but what, what is the most important thing for us to achieve with this project moving forward? Before describing the tracking and forecasting process, again, it's what we're mainly about today, let's talk a little bit about how your software plan is derived. Many companies estimate by creating detailed plans, really, um, either based on the roles needed for a task um, or a task list, commonly referred to as bottoms-up estimates. The last really big project I worked on was a very large pharmacy development application. And, you know, we had departments for every role almost. And, and so we actually did role-based estimates. But these approaches have challenges. And the main one being a lack of focus on the total scope of the project. Plus, there's difficulty in getting that detailed data in a timely fashion anyway. So these can take a long time. It's not a bad way to go. Um, and some really good plans could come out this way. It just, it's fraught with a lot of, of challenge, challenges. Slim scope-based method uses your estimate, of the pro, your estimate of the product size and a productivity or efficiency of your development environment to determine time and effort.
this is a, a, a typical output from Slim Estimate, our uh, estimating application, and it lets you calculate a defensible estimate in a very short time by using just five core metrics. So that's what I've highlighted over here, um, blown up this particular image here. We've, uh, we typically show for the develop, main development effort plus any other activities you might have included in your life cycle, um, we only have uh, the main development here. So the, um, you can see the core metrics are really what we're focusing on here. We've got duration, effort, uh, effort in, and the cost associated with that effort, staffing levels, and even a, a quality or reliability number. Um, our size is, this is just a generic uh, 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 unit of measure for software size that we sometimes use. And here's the efficiency. So you can see we're staying very um, high level. These uh, charts over here are scatter plots. I, I know they're small, but um, we'll have a bigger image in, in a few moments. But they're, they're the software size is plotted on the x-axis. And for this particular case, we've got, the again, the, the estimated duration for the project and the estimated effort. And this little blue dot here is this current estimate solution. And the lines are statistical trend lines. And we've also got here uh, these other little teensy tiny uh, data points are our own historical projects. So this is the way that we can, you know, look at the estimate or the plan and sanity check it against industry data, uh, which can be super powerful. And then, of course, a best practice would be to also have some of your own data. So before we ever get started with the project, a best practice, of course, is to have uh, a very good plan. Um, QSM's industry database contains over 14,000 uh, completed projects, and it provides the size and the productivity data not generally available early in the life cycle. And not only do you get that benefit, but you can, uh, again, use it to sanity check your estimates and identify unrealistic expectations. So if you have used Slim Estimate and you, do, and you don't have to, but if you have, then you import that estimate into Slim Control, which is the tracking and forecasting tool. And it creates this plan showing the um, each of the major management metrics. In this example, um, here's the schedule, pretty simple, just a single uh, bar on a, on a Gantt chart. We've got uh, our staffing plan. This is a level loaded, we tend uh, a very a small team. And this is the uh, buildup of the construction. Again, that's the generic uh, implementation unit that came from the estimate. Um, but here we actually added another size measure of features um, and you can add as many as you want. So you wanna think ahead of time is what, what is it that is really super important uh, for me to track? QSM, uh, you know, as a, as a corporation, we work with large organizations uh, using the scaled agile framework, and we've helped people track progress based on uh, several size measures as they are decomposed from. You might start with capabilities and then uh, also track epics and then features and stories. And it's, it's not that hard, and it's extremely valuable to see how these uh, track with each other and understand their relationships and the relative sizes. Um, and dependencies. Um, but you don't have to use Slim Estimate to use Slim Control. Um, it can work with any plan you've got, and you can enter a custom plan. These five core metrics are used throughout the Slim suite of tools, and for each time tracking period, you will enter the actual data for the first four metrics. So size, how many epics have we built out yet, or how many stories have been completed? The time, and that's simply a, a matter of entering uh, the start and end dates and maybe some milestone dates for certain uh, activities, the like requirements and design. When did we start requirements and design? When do we plan to finish that? Those milestones and start and end dates help mark the time and actual time. When did, you know, we said we were going to start on 
on June 1st, but we actually didn't get started until the 15th. That's that's the difference between the plan versus the actual, let's say. Um, the effort primarily expressed in terms of hours worked or full-time equivalent staffing, and you have your choice about you know which which actual date is easiest for you to go and get. And then defects found. Uh, one thing I really loved about the SLIM tools when I was first introduced was the the, the modeling of, of how many defects you should um, expect. And even if you didn't have a plan for detect, defects, counting your actual defects and making sure that they're decreasing uh, before you ship is really an important uh, concept. The fifth core metric uh, is called the productivity index in SLIM. And it's a, it's a whole project metric. Um, the plan, when it comes from SLIM estimate, has an implied productivity index, you know, the efficiency level, let's say, that your plan says that you need to meet in order to deliver on your goals. So that's what the PI is, and that's part of uh, the plan. The plan in SLIM control is simply those metrics that you want to track during the project. We call those uh, plan assumptions, and this is a screen of, of what they might look like. And you can uh, see over here that there are not a lot. Uh, we've got the, the, the five, we've got the core metrics. Uh, productivity is, doesn't show up here, but we've got the core metrics and there's several defect uh, metrics because they're just broken out by severity class. We also, I mean, you could track just the total defects if you, if you wanted to. But for each metric then, what SLIM Control wants to know is when should I start seeing and collect actual measures for this uh, actual data for this particular measure, right? So staffing would be starting at the very beginning of the project, um, for whatever set of activities are being performed first. And at some in staffing, we would probably calculate or, or capture the actuals all the way through the project, right? Because people are hopefully <laughs> not stopping working and they're always working. Uh, here I've got highlighted, uh, highlighted that um, size measure that we happen to be using. And this would start not until the development and, and testing effort starts. And it, but it will also go all the way through the end of the life cycle. And how many units of the, how many, what is, how many items do you expect to build? Uh, this is, a, again, thousands of implementation units, roughly equivalent to a line of code. But you would have, um, notice we have, you know, features completed here. We would, maybe we expect to complete 240 features. So whatever your measure is, you just tell it when to start, when does it end? And how many do we have? The other the other thing that's that happens just in slim control is this idea of a production pattern, and that's the the uh, when I get to show you a couple of more charts. That's just that typically that S curve where you're starting up and it and it builds up. And the other thing you might want to think about is you know again like for the for the example of effort, do I is it easy for me to just give the uh, number of staff that's working on the project? Or, or do I have a nice system where I can go and pull uh, the person hours out? So again, just very uh, simple, not a whole lot of, of information. So once we've got that plan entered, then like the estimate, we want to compare uh, that plan to industry trends. Now, if it's, you know, if it's come from that estimate, then you may, you may have already done that step. But what you're looking for here is that just that good feeling that is, is this a good plan? So these are very similar, uh, if, if not the same scatter plots I showed a while ago. Now this particular example is, um, is uh, still that same uh, release that, that QS, QSM did. Um, but in this particular case, these trend lines are our, are constructed from our own history. Um, and so, it, it, again, you can see it gives you a good comfort feeling that this, est this plan is very much falling in line with what we've been able to do in the past. Um, you know, one of our uh, consultants was supporting a large def defense system. And he, you know, did an estimate and plan and made sure they were consistent with the trends. 
and management rejected what he came up with. Um, they wanted it faster, of course. He quickly replanned in estimate to reflect their goals, and that was quite aggressive. Uh, when the completed project came in, it was almost on the dot to our consultant's original estimate. Um, it took them twice as long as they wanted. So there's really a lot of ROI um, if you can uh, avoid this kind of disaster. Um, and, and similarly, um, you know, even for one of our own uh, Slim Suite releases, we put out and, and determined a date for that release based on a sales goal. Um, we got it out on time, but we had to do four point releases because the quality wasn't great. So trying to release early just wasn't a good idea. Uh, we went back to management and said, let's never do this again. So for future releases, you know, uh, since that time have been extremely good quality and it also reduces maintenance. So again, this the quality uh, it is really much a very much a part of your plan, and, and I hope it is for you. And this the, this kind of comparison is a it's an important easy step. Um, so what we want to talk about next is exactly you know get some idea of what is the 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 data that we want to collect. So we talked about the plan, validating it. The second step is to go ahead and start collecting that, that actual data, which requires a little bit of planning of its own. What data is available for the size measure? Um, features, stories, story points, lines of code. Um, there's probably other measures that you're used to working with. And it is nice these days that people are explicitly dealing with size much more than they used to. I think we can thank Agile development for that. Up the time, again, some start and end dates to a set of activities, um, fairly straightforward. The effort I've talked about already, either person hours or full-time equivalents, but we want to get them, if we can, and if your development process supports it, uh, tie these hours to a set of development activities. And then, of course, if, you know, defects is a, is a nice to have. You don't have to collect uh, defects, but um, if you can, then something like defects found, how many fixed, and then ultimately calculating the reliability uh, of the application. Where's the data stored? These days, you know, we have a lot of this data in other tools that we use. It could be a, a, a PPM tool, some other kind of project tracking software, um, maybe a lot of information about sizing and effort or counting number of tasks could be in JIRA or another application like Rally. There's, you know, there's all kinds. Um, if you're working with line of codes, uh, then you can use your configuration library and go and get and pull a line of code count. We do this in uh, at QSM. We have, we do both. We have a, a, a tracking system for our requirements and bugs. And so, and we call the requirements features. So we will do both. We'll get a line of code count, actual, what have we done this month? And then how, how does that, how many features have we also completed? And then we can see how those relate to each other. And then the last, there may be some conversions required, probably not a lot. Again, effort comes in as effort. Um, we may wanna map the, that effort to slim phases. Um, and you may have to aggregate over a certain reporting period. So let's say you're only uh, gathering actuals monthly, but you have data uh, every week, then of course you might need to aggregate those. Very you know, simple stuff I'm sure you're used to already. So like the plan assumptions, this is a, an image of what it would look like to uh, enter your actual data. You can, there are report certain reporting periods. We just come in here and say, well, how many people were working this month? How, how much functionality did we complete this month or could be weeks or sprints? Um, you know, there are defects by category again, if you want to, same things we were looking at in the plan. A nice feature is that the, um, you know, for each reporting period and each metric as you kind of walk through the grid, it slim control will tell you what that plan value is. <laughs> so you kind of already get 
uh, an immediate kind of barometer of, of what's going on. And another neat thing to do or a good practice is to put in some explanatory notes that might help either remind yourself of what was going on this reporting period, um, maybe help somebody else help you figure out what to go do about it. So in this case, we were making a note that, you know, the defects were were high this reporting period, but we understand that that's, you know, not necessarily coding issues, that we upgraded some packages in our platform um, and that caused a few issues. So once you have the plan and the actuals, here's the most interesting and exciting part, and that is being able to have the visuals of the actuals versus plan. Um, these control charts provide great insight, and we're going to talk about forecasting in a few minutes, but um, even just tracking alone by itself can be uh, extremely valuable. Uh, this is uh, some charts for, uh, this is the number of staffing on the project. You can see it's a quite a long project. Um, the This is just the total number of tasks to be completed. And this is actually some of, of the lifecycle deliverables. So what you're looking at is the plan is uh, how things should shape out over time is the blue line. And associated with those in slim control are control bounds, these yellow configurable area um, that you set up for your tolerance for deviations from plan, right? We, won't, we don't want to overreact uh, if something is not exactly on plan because it, you know, if something is exactly matching plan, I would actually be suspicious. <laughs> you should expect a little variability, maybe not with staffing so much, but it does, we do find that that is a common a common problem, right? Projects get behind because they just don't get the staff on board as quickly as they needed to, like kind of like in this example. Um, but when you deviate away from uh, the green and then, then you see the traffic lights on your chart, and of course, red is, is no good. So that you're getting here that GPS early warning and it causes you to ask questions. Why are we behind? And that may need that may prompt you to go and collect another metric. You may need to go define another metric to get more insight into really what, what's going on. You, you know, development work is hard and collecting data takes effort, but it's super worth it. Um, what you're looking at here is a, a, some charts from, a, a, again, another one of our consultants was doing some e expert witness uh, tasks. And she reconstructed the vendor's project tracking of only effort and time. But she added the size, right? What are you getting for all that time and effort? And the product development fell behind right away. Um, you, you could see it back here for sure in, in these two charts. And you didn't even have to forecast it to see it. And not having this kind of visual, the customer didn't know what questions to ask. Um, so again, this is a good approach for anyone who's doing vendor management. Uh, this view shows the progression of the deliverables and how far, how far behind they were. And an important and unique benefit of slim control is the calculation of the implied productivity index. And these are tiny numbers here, but um, each reporting period, we've got the productivity index and we've got what we planned versus what efficiency are we actually achieving. And it turns out that, you know, when our consultant reconstructed and validated the vendor's estimate, it was considered reasonable against industry trends. So it actually was and should have been a decent plan, but um, their actual PI is far below that plan. And it just shows one of the reasons that this project was in jeopardy. Um, the next step is to, uh, before we compare multiple forecasts, of course, we have to at least calculate one or more forecasts. Um, so. Once you've identified, you know, that maybe there's some issues, 
This will help you figure out what should be done. We are going to extrapolate how things are. Uh, same scope, same staffing, right? We're just going to extrapolate our current plan out and see where we end up. Um, and then we can do some what ifing and we can explore the range of, of potential outcomes. So Slim Control provides three types of forecasts and curve fit is the most common one um, and the, the first one you should do. And what it does is it forecasts by finding a, a theoretical Rayleigh curve that best fits your actual data for each metric. So for, for the, the construction, for the defects, for the features, they each have their own uh, forecast. Early in the life cycles, uh, milestones is a, another component of your plan, can carry more weight in a forecast. Are we reaching those dates that we thought we would? Later on in the project, then the actual product construction and the defects carry more weight. Um, those are defaults within the tool, but you can, of course, um, specify your own weights. You have to ask yourself, well, which metric do I think is really the the one I believe the most, the most reliable, and I've been in your forecast, you could put more weight on that particular uh, metric. Another kind of forecasting done in some control is a trade-off forecast. Um, this is where, you know, I, I briefly mentioned that SLIM models a non-linear trade-off between time and effort. Um, software development is not manufacturing. So putting twice as many people on a project to compress the schedule is just not going to get you what you think it does. Um, so what you can do here is you uh, enter a new level of staffing value and SLIM control will calculate your new end date um, and you can see the schedule and cost implications for that. And this, this is just an example of, you know, um, these forecasting assumptions look just like the plan assumptions. So maybe that first time you run your curve forecast, curve fit, you're not going to change anything. But maybe you run another scenario and say, you know, well, we think they might want to add 10 more features. And what would that do to our project? And then you could just up the number of features. Um, we've actually, in one of our uh, recent releases at QSM, we, um, we overestimated the size. And so our new forecasts were actually based on going in and reducing the scope. So it goes, it goes, uh, can go either way. And lastly, the third kind of forecast is what we call a maintenance forecast. This is when um, development uh, is over, we've completed and we're ready to release. And um, we want to make sure that we reach our quality goal. This could be, you know, uh, software for medical devices or something that uh, some kind of application that really needs to be of high quality. Then you iterate on different dates and see what the reliability would be based on uh, working, let's say, another three months to remove uh, the defects that are currently within the system. And again, um, it can be, you know, just because the end of the price, that schedule says the end of the project is over, doesn't mean that the product really is good enough to go out the door. And this can help you figure that out. So once we run a forecast, then this is what it looks like. Um, we've got our Gantt chart that's a little bit more exciting for this project than the one I showed earlier. These are uh, four development phases, the, and the plan is the blue bar. And then, you know, we've started collecting actuals. This set of activities took later than we thought, and also so did this one. Um, and this actual, it tells us where we are. Uh, today with this uh, little green arrow there. Oh, you can't see my mouse. Yeah, you can. The little green arrow there uh, is a as of date and our, our status uh, tells us the deviations down here. So similar, similar plots from what we saw originally. We've got our actuals and, and this is our plan. And, and then the forecast it will clearly give us a picture 
of where, where we're going to end up based on how we're performing today. And, you know, you can use this to uh, negotiate. Um, you know, the productivity index, if it's not up to snuff, it's a lot of times is not going to magically uh, get better. So we kind of have to go with what we've got. Uh, and again, you might need you might need to reduce functionality. Uh, we can't get it all to you now. Let's do a two, re, two release scenario. We'll get you the most important features now and we'll deliver the ne next in the next release. So hopefully you do have some room to negotiate. You may not, but this would certainly help communicate uh, the possibilities to the decision makers. And again, more than anything else, you can visualize, you know, on the top of the hill, uh, what this looks like and communicate it with others. Can't really get that from uh, a spreadsheet. Spreadsheets and detailed plans and tracking are good data, uh, but not always in a digestible form. Another good practice is to take what we call a snapshot and of the tracking metrics each reporting period. Um, so th these are four different months worth of tracking up here. Uh, these are the metrics that we're tracking and you can see that progression from green, uh, hopefully staying green, uh, but some of them uh, not so much and it shows you how things kind of went downhill. Uh, and you, so you're capturing that traffic-like status every reporting period. And here, uh, you know, you can select the charts again at each reporting period that show the most important outcomes, good or bad, hopefully some good, and use this note section to explain your findings and your recommended action. So you could point out what was going on this month with the two charts with some descriptive data here. And, and then you can see the trends over time and it provides a great audit trail. Too often, I think, project plans aren't formally updated or rebaselined. Um, and so this, this kind of history can be extremely valuable. So you've seen one example of a forecast, but again, the power of, of all of the uh, slim tools is the, the ability to quickly and easily explore a range of potential head outcomes, and then compare them. Don't settle for one potential solution. Uh, so we've uh, got, we've run multiple forecasts. The actuals are what the actuals are, but we can do those what if scenarios, run multiple forecasts, and we can, uh, it's really the next slide coming up, but this kind of goes along with this slide too, which is we can turn a forecast into the plan. You know, once we kind of say, okay, you know what, I'm going to go with this forecast. It's the one that makes the most sense to me based on the weights of the metrics I gave. Um, I'm going to turn that into the new plan. Um, but you can continue to kind of do your analysis. And maybe a month from now, you might want to replan again. Hopefully things aren't that fluctuating. Uh, but again, the, the possibilities are here. So what might be different about each forecast? Well, the reporting period for one, right? It's going to be as of this date. It's either a re more recent forecast or maybe it's an older one. Um, and the forecast assumptions would be different. Again, that idea of let's see what happens if we reduce the scope or let's see what happens if we go and, and add a couple more people to the project. And again, you can decide which metrics or which indicators carry the most weight in your forecast. Um, you know, you probably want to run a, a one that's optimistic because you know your boss is going to ask you about <laughs> achieving those aggressive goals. You could run the forecast that's optimistic and then one that's pessimistic and then maybe have the one that, that you really favor as your recommended forecast. Oops. So the last step, again, I kind of mentioned just previously was to make the forecast the current plan. So you can see here, we don't have that blue line anymore. 
um, it's over here because this is this particular chart is is designed to show all three. Um, but here and this one, I guess, could be two. But it shows you that you know the history of the current plan is the actuals, and then we're just using that that green forecast line moving forward. So we've baselined this plan, and this is what we expect to happen uh, as of as of today. Um, you know, software project management is hard. When I was a project manager, I heard colleagues say the project managers get all the responsibility and no authority. Um, but hopefully taking these steps that we've talked about today um, helps stakeholders understand the situation and help them buy in or at least foster uh, some successful negotiations for, for better outcomes. So, you know, to keep your project uh, heading in the right direction. We want to base plans on known capabilities, include product and quality metrics in the things that you're tracking and looking at. Those really are the real indicators. Capture actual data at regular intervals. We're only talking five or less metrics. Do some Management assessments and, and with reports and charts, if you can. Again, communicating with others goes a long, long way. Forecast to complete what what if, right? What's what might happen if, and at least do a, a handful. And then take that trusted forecast um, and make that your new plan. So thanks again for your, your time and attention today. I, I hope that, that some of this was um, helpful to you. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Laura, I have one for you. Uh, do your tools integrate with JIRA or any other software management packages? Uh, yeah, can. We uh, we have an API for Slim Control and uh, Slim Estimate as well. And we've built a, a prototype of an integration between Slim Estimate and JIRA um, for Slim Estimate and a full integration between Estimate and Clarity, the PPM tool. Um, and QSM is happy to work with you uh, to, you know, work with you to, to do the same for Slim Control. Uh, often creating really an Excel integration using a data export from one of those tools is a really good place to start. So you were talking about productivity earlier or on basing your plans on your known capabilities. How do you measure productivity? That is a good question. SLIM's productivity index is unique to our approach, and it comes from um, the original work by uh, Larry Putnam Sr. in developing uh, the software production equation. But basically, it's, it's an overall efficiency of your development environment, and it's impacted or it accounts for the influences of factors like your tools and methods, the technical complexity of the work that you're trying to do, and, and even management style. So it's calculated from completed projects. We just need to know what is the actual software size when the project is over, how much calendar time did you spend, and how much effort. Um, and then we can calculate the productivity index. And if you want to, you know, uh, just ask, you know, send us an email if you want to learn more. We also have several articles on the QSM website. So you talked earlier about running multiple forecasts or about what ifing. Can you give some examples of the types of things you might vary or why would you be doing this? And also with the optimistic and pessimistic uh, forecasts, 
Can you just expand on that a little bit? Sure. Uh, you know, so the software size is pretty important. And early on in the estimating and planning process, we, you know, we may not have as much data as we'd like and our project uh, estimate and plan may be off on the scope a little bit. So that's one, uh, one of the first things I would look at is, okay, I think, I think we're going to deliver, um, let's say, uh, 2,000 story points. Maybe that's the estimate that we were working with um, or a certain number of stories. That's my plan. But if I'm going to forecast, I would forecast the actuals, you know, maybe we've done, uh, we should have done as of this point in the project, we've done 100 story points or 300, uh, let's say, um, and we've completed 250. So maybe we're slightly behind. My first forecast would be just sticking with that estimate of 300, but I might also bump it up a little bit to see what might happen if we underestimated um, or hopefully not. We have to add more work <laughs> that happens to, or we, I could, I could do one and say, well, you know, we've only done 250, but I think we understand the application pretty well. Why don't we redo, why don't we do a forecast based on the fact that it's not 300? It may be less than that. And then I could do the same, the same scenario kind of applies uh, for staffing. Uh, you know, we have a small development team at QSM and, and we know what our plan should be, but, you know, people get diverted on other projects and, and we don't always get everybody working uh, that we need to. And that's a common across uh, organization. So again, you could say, you know, what if we don't get everybody working or um, if you are behind and you think you can uh, remedy that with a bigger staff, then you would run that scenario. So just kind of common sense stuff. Does your tool support earned value analysis? It it does. It's kind of a secondary thought uh, that we have in there because a lot, of course, a lot of project managers are used to that. Um, so the answer is yes. You select, uh, you know, we talked about measuring different uh, tracking uh, and forecasting based on different metrics. And in Slim Control, uh, you pick the metric that you want to represent uh, the best breakdown of the tasks that need to be completed. Um, or the size, whatever, what do you think is the best size measure? Uh, and both the plan and the actual data have to have been entered to the current date. And then we just have an earn value wizard that computes uh, the metrics that uh, earn value is, is built upon. About the trade-off forecast, does, yep. does your tool consider when you're making changes? In other words, uh, if you add the same number of staff at different points in the project, does it have the same effect on the uh, delivery date? Well, each forecast has an as-of date. And they would be independent. So I'm I'm thinking, um, let's say we have five people, and um, I run want to run a forecast that says, well, what if I I bumped it up to eight? And that would be one forecast, and I would log and save that. Um, and then maybe next month, um, you know, we have six, but we're not eight. Um, I might want to to play with it again. Is that what you mean? I mean, they're just, they're independent forecasts and, and you can, you, your actuals is actually going to be the most reliable. Um, is that answering your question or? Well, I what I was thinking, this is Kate, if I could just add something. Yeah, sure. Um, one of the neat things with some control, and I, I use it every month to monitor our, our software development projects, 
one of the nice things about slim control is, is letting you visualize things and sort of having a visual representation or a prediction, a way to predicting what will happen if you do various things. And one thing we've seen a lot in our data backs this up in our database is that corrections made early on, you know, it, it's very much like when you're driving a car, corrections made early on in the project really can have a much larger impact. And that's where having those stoplights to sort of warn you when something is coming off track so that you can make those early course corrections. For instance, if you you might be able to get away with adding a person or two at the beginning of the project. If you wait until almost to the end of the project and add one or two people, you're, most of what you're going to do is see a hit to your quality because those people don't have the time to get up to speed and to actually know, you know, be familiar with the project. So often you, what you see is a spike in mistakes or what we see is defects. Excellent point. Yeah. Thank you for that. Actually, I had one more thought. That <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> the other thing that's maybe not intuitive is a lot of times the reason management adds people to a project is they are trying to bring in the schedule and that can work on smaller projects with an early course correction because again there's enough time for those new staff members to get up to speed when you do it late in the project sometimes you can even push the project out even later and, and not only do you not get any schedule compression but you're actually going to be later than you would have if you just kept going the way you are. And that's one of the nice things Slum Control can actually show you in real time because it's got all of this trade-off behavior that is inherent in the data built into the tool. Great, thanks. Well, if there aren't any more questions, again, I really appreciate your, your time today. Um, I hope that this was valuable. We will, uh, as we, uh, I guess, indicated in the beginning, that make the recording available and send that out. Um, and let us know if you, if you have uh, any other questions, you can send us uh, an email. So have a good rest of your day. Thanks again, folks. Appreciate it.